Before we get started with today's show, I just wanted to let you know that the online course Chloe and I have been working on is about ready to go live. And we're going to kick it off with a free class called the 50 Minute Relationship Breakthrough. I'll let you know when that free class is happening through email. All you have to do to be on the list to get notified is to download the free guide from my website. The website is neilsatin.com, and if you go there and click the Send Me the Action Plan button and enter the information required, you'll not only get the free guide, but you will also be notified when our free class is going live. On top of that, you can also just text the word relationship to the number 33444 and follow the instructions, which will get you a link to the free guide and also get you notified. All right, I look forward to seeing you for our free class and hopefully for our online course. On with today's show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. On this show, we're trying to give you all the helpful tools that you need to have amazing, thriving relationships. And I'm not sure about you, but I'm guessing that somewhere in your life, if not in your romantic relationship, but maybe a parent or a sibling or a coworker, at some point you've felt like someone has manipulated you using fear, using your sense of duty or obligation, or using guilt to try and get you to do things the way they want you to do them. This is otherwise known as emotional blackmail. And in this episode, we're going to show you how to spot emotional blackmail in action, some diagnostics around why it's happening and and how to prevent it, and then um, how to take action when it's coming up in your relationships. So I want this to be a really practical guide for you. And in order to cover this ground, we have the world's foremost expert on emotional blackmail. Her name is Susan Forward, and she is one of the nation's leading psychotherapists, as well as a best-selling author, who's appeared on numerous talk shows, wrote the number one New York Times bestseller, Men Who Hate Women and the Women Who Love Them, and Toxic Parents. And she is also the author of the book, Emotional Blackmail, When the People in Your Life Use Fear, Obligation, and Guilt to Manipulate You. If you are interested in getting the uh, show guide for this episode, which we always try to have be as detailed as possible, you can download that at either neilsatin.com slash blackmail or you can text the word passion to the number 33444 and follow the instructions and we'll email you a link so that you can download the show guide for this episode and all of our other episodes. And at this point, there have been over 50, so it's pretty exciting. Um, anyhow, it's very exciting to have with me today, Susan Forward. Thank you so much for joining us here on Relationship Alive, Susan. Oh, thank you, Neil. I'm delighted to be here. I guess we should just start right off the bat with uh, what is emotional blackmail and how can someone identify that it's happening in their life? Yeah, um, I think we all have interactions where we get the feeling that we've kind of been had. Like, I never can win with this person. Uh, what happens that certain people leave us thinking I've lost again? Uh, why do I always give in? Why didn't I say what I was really feeling? Uh, it's a question of not a satisfactory exchange or obviously it primarily happens in a conflict somebody wants something they make a demand on you it is not something you particularly want to do and if you express your unwillingness then you'll get some kind of threat uh, it may be very blatant uh, if you go out of this house tonight, I won't be here when you come back, is a classic version of emotional blackmail. Uh, if you do this, the consequences are going to be very unhappy for you. Um, and some of them are very subtle because we all have been in relationships and maybe are in relationships with people who will sulk 
or pout or let us know that they're upset with us in very passive aggressive indirect ways but whether it's blatant or whether it's subtle you know that something is happening inside of you where you find yourself giving in to avoid the unpleasantness the, the discomfort of those awful feelings of uh, uh, being upset with having someone upset with you you're upset that you haven't stood your ground or expressed what you really want and need and all in all the transactions are unsatisfactory for you yeah and what and is is someone always going to be the target of emotional blackmail or is it common that you may actually be employing those tactics yourself um, even while being subject to them yeah, I think that usually there's a, a very definite imbalance of power and that a pattern will set in where one person kind of knows where our hot buttons are and knows exactly where our vulnerabilities are and tends to use them. Uh, and you mentioned fear, obligation, and guilt. And if you look at the first three letters of that word, of those three words, what do they spell? They spell fog. And when we're being emotionally blackmailed, we often feel as if we're in a fog, uh, that we can't find our way out, we don't see clearly, we don't come up with ways of uh, protecting ourselves with boundaries and limit-setting statements, and uh, we have a tendency to comply. Uh, if you have, as I had for years, the, the need to please a disease, which means, you know, peace at any price, I'll give in, just don't be mad at me. It's like when you yell at a dog and it rolls over on its back and, and it's like anything, just don't be mad at me. And it, we, we have a tendency, if we're very vulnerable to this kind of uh, very unhealthy treatment and very unloving treatment, uh, and yet we justify and rationalize it. Do we do it ourselves? Sure. Uh, everybody does it to some extent. It, it, the, the lethality of it really only kicks in when it really puts the person who is the target of the emotional blackmail in a depressed, angry, uh, feeling like kind of a jerk. And those feelings kind of get internalized and uh, because the person doesn't dare express them for fear of, of their consequences and, and retaliation. And so as a result, we've got all this garbage cooking around inside of us. We know that something's wrong. We know that we should be more assertive and we're self-protective, but we don't have the tools. And that's one thing I'm hoping to give your audience today are the tools the behavioral strategies to deal with emotional blackmail. It doesn't mean a relationship has to end. It means that there are ways that you can equalize the balance of power. So you've seen people come back from situations where they are being emotionally blackmailed and and actually come back into balance and have a healthy healthy dialogue, healthy relationship with someone. Yeah, I mean, if, if both people are coming from basically a position of goodwill, which is hard to believe when somebody is, is using these techniques on you and these these manipulations on you, but if there's basically a relationship that you think is worth saving, and that, as you indicated, includes partners, parents, coworkers, friends, because everybody does this, but when it gets to the point where it's so imbalanced that that's the primary way that uh, you are reacting to somebody rather than responding with uh, self-protective uh, boundary setting, uh, stating what is and isn't okay for you, setting limits, and standing up for your own truth, and just finding those ways, which I will, you know, kind of alliterate here, um, it's just, it takes courage. I'm not saying it doesn't take courage, because we're all terrified of other people's anger. 
Yeah, and especially when it comes to the retaliation piece, whether it's you know fear of losing your job or fear yeah. of fear uh, losing a person. Yeah, yeah, or having your your kids uh, poisoned because you're fighting with your ex spouse, or you know there are all those ways where those fears are real and yeah. And I'm, I think we'll get to this. I don't know if now is necessarily the right time, but I'm hoping that we'll get a chance to talk about what do you do with that when those feels, when those fears actually are real Mm -hmm. and yet the cost. Yeah. Actually, maybe this is a good question. It's this sense of, cause I, I think hopefully we can all relate to this, um, cost benefit analysis that we can do in our heads around like, is it worth it? Is it worth it for me to take this stand? I'm wondering how, from your perspective, how do we know whether it's worth it based on what we think the worst possible outcome might be? Well, you have to try out new responses and you'll never know if it's worth it. If the person you're dealing with is so locked into their angry, defensive way of being, uh, it may not be worth it. And that includes everyone in your life. I don't care what their name is. If it's husband, mother, father, sister, child, if somebody is consistently making you feel like you're a pawn in their life, basically, and moving you around that chessboard according to their whims. Uh, and if your fears take over when you're being pressured, because emotional blackmail is a very intense form of pressure, and if you're so afraid of their disapproval or of their anger or if, of feeling the guilt. I know I had, I worked very intensively with one woman <clears throat> whose mother was a really terrible and unloving and was very abusive to her when she was little. And then the mother got cancer. And she said to me, I need to not have a relationship with her for my own sanity, but I don't think I could stand the guilt if I did, if I broke off with her. So you can see that the fear of what you might feel, the uh, guilt is such a terrible, powerful force for so many of us and forces so many unhealthy, self-defeating choices for us. So it's a question of realizing that you can tolerate the guilt guilt will diminish in the service of becoming a healthier and stronger person. And that's one of the things I teach the people that I work with, is that nobody ever died from guilt that I'm aware of. But while guilt will diminish the constant erosion of your confidence, your self-respect, your dignity will not diminish And it's like water wearing away on a rock, and the rock becomes a stone, and then it becomes a pebble. And I don't want to see anybody give up so much of themselves. You always hear so much from people so often, I gave up myself in that relationship. I don't know who I am anymore. Well, if you can get into to what's really going on, chances are, let's leave the extreme cases of emotional abuse outside for a moment, because those are frequently relationships that cannot be salvaged. But if it's a question of being manipulated and controlled by guilt, you can very often change that with the courage uh, to overcome your fears. Mm. Before we dive deeper, I'm wondering if we can speak to, um, like, how would someone recognize if they are committing emotional blackmail? So I think everyone who's receiving it is probably pretty clear about that right now. But if, like, let's all just take an honest look at ourselves. And and I'm Mm -hmm. just saying this honestly because I I loved your book. So practical. Um. And at the same time, I think it was probably, and I've read lots and lots of books at this point, probably one of the most triggering books that I've ever read, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you you know, because I was seeing things like, oh, this is where I have done this to other people Mm -hmm. or, or like recognizing all the times that I've been on the receiving end and just how uncomfortable that made me. Um, So... So in all fairness, um, to our listeners who might be wondering, like, am I doing this to other people? How would they know? Um, 
I think that you look at when you don't get your way with somebody, what do you do, okay? You step back and kind of become an observer. Um, what's your motive here? Is your, all right, you know, let's take a simple situation. Uh, two friends, one wants to go to see a certain movie, the other one doesn't. Um, so the friend that wants to go says, you know, I'd really love to see this movie. I read great things about it, et cetera. And the other one says, yeah, but I'm really tired uh, tonight. And the other one gets, you know, more coaxing and, and more pleading. And uh, the one who is not wanting to go starts to feel awful because she's letting her friend down. But she kind of hangs in there and says, you know, we'll do it another time. And the friend who wants to go gets pouty, doesn't call for a while. She she gets punitive. See, that's just one of the things with emotional blackmailers. They punish. And they punish through withholding or they punish overtly by saying, really, well, you know what? If you just can't uh, do something that would really please me, I don't think, <clears throat> excuse me, got a little frog in my throat today. Um, I don't think that we've really got much of a friendship. And all of a sudden, the, 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 the target of this is panicked. She doesn't want to lose the friend, so she gives in and doesn't want to, and the friend who does want to go and gets her way believes that she's won. Well, she may have won the battle, but she hasn't won the war because the resentment that the other friend feels can be fairly intense. So I think that what you need to look at, every all of us, because God knows I've done this myself plenty of times, we all want our way. We all want, we want what we want. And if somebody doesn't want it, disagrees with us, is not where we want them to be, we may start pulling out a bunch of these emotional blackmail t uh, tactics. Uh, how can you be so selfish? Uh, if you really loved me, if you really cared about me, if you find yourself saying things like that, yeah, you're using emotional blackmail. And I think you're absolutely right that everybody does it. It's a question of how much and to what degree. If it's once in a while, not anything to worry about too much. But on the other hand, it's because, see, we take things so personally. Somebody doesn't call you when you, they say they're going to. Uh, you get upset and you say, okay, what's wrong with me? They don't like me anymore. And as a result, because you are taking it, you never stop to think that maybe they're busy or they're not feeling okay. And then you get on the phone and say, you know what, I'm really hurt. I was expecting you to call me, and I don't understand what kind of relationship this is if you can't even call when you say you're going to. And I just think that we need to cool it for a while. So there are the kind. See, there's a, a demand. There's the pressure to do it. And then there is the threat of the consequences. I don't think we ought to have much to do with each other anymore because you're not dependable. Yeah, That's a classic example of the structure of emotional blackmail. And I think if you look at that honestly, you can probably see that you do it plenty yourself. So two points of clarification there. Mm -hmm. One is the demand. Right. Is there a demand, like let's say that one person is asking for something and the other person um, asking for some sort of change, like I'd like to do... Um, date nights on Saturday <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and the partner who, um, who's being asked, like, so that could be the demand, but then is it possible for someone to be making a dem demand by basically saying, I don't want to change? Like, like, no, no, actually, I don't want to do date nights on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And if you make me do date nights on Saturday, there's going to be a lot of trouble. So it's, so their demand is in a sense that everything stays the same. Does that qualify, too? Um, yeah. A lot of people will say, this is who I am. Deal with it. And I don't want to to change what the way we've got things set up. Is that emotional blackmail? I think there has to be um, consequences. And I think there has to be pressure to define it really as it, demand, pressure, statement of consequences. 
Um, so I'm not sure that that scenario really fits all that well. You might just be dealing with somebody who's very rigid and very ritualistic. And, you know, change is scary to almost everybody. Uh, but I think the loving thing in that kind of a situation uh, would be, can you help me understand why you're not willing to do that? And that very often, if you start uh, a question with, will you help me understand, that kind of allows the other person to put their defenses and their resistance down to some extent, and you may get some kind of communication going that way. Because in emotional blackmail, there's not much communication. It's a question, this is what I want, this is what I want you to do, and if you don't do it, here's what's going to happen. Yeah, and as silly as this example is of date nights on Saturdays, let's just for a minute suppose that the person who's asking for the date nights, they're really feeling totally neglected in the relationship and like Mm -hmm. there's no spark and they're actually on the verge of filing for divorce. Mm -hmm. At what point can they introduce that? Like, or is there, is it all in the way that you introduce it that distinguishes it from being a, um, a punish a punishing kind of right. consequence versus like well this is what i have to do if you're not going to like talk to me about this thing then i might have to just file for divorce cuz i don't i can't tolerate this you know mm-hmm. yeah. and that's a pretty extreme result for a rather <laughs> minor infraction um but yeah i mean there are some people you know that 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 will threaten dire consequences over the most petty thing. I mean, the house is a mess again. I can't handle this. I can't live like this. I'm out of here. Um, that's not emotional blackmail because the other person, I mean, the, the, that was uh, everything all at once and kind of crazy. <laughs> and, you know, and, and kind of nutty to uh, to walk out. There's obviously a lot more going on under the surface than, than the fact that the house may not be as tidy as it could be. Uh, and in your example as well, why would it sounds as if there's been a build up of stuff? Yeah, before, yeah. And and so maybe the person who's the target at that point could say, "Oh, hold on." Um, I'm not saying a complete no uh, about it, but can we talk about why this is important to you? Uh, can we at least start a dialogue about what's going on? See, in emotional blackmail, there isn't much communication. Yeah. Uh, to use, you know, communication has become such a cliche, but it really is, as you know, and I know, and anybody who works with people knows, it is the basis of a relationship and whether it's going to be healthy or not. And if you communicate with threats, you owe me, uh, how can you, know, how can you do this to me? Um, how can you be so cold? Uh, if you really cared, if you were really a good wife, what you would do would be to stop everything you're doing and clean up the house immediately. And so it's that demand followed by the pressure to comply with the demand, then followed by the punishing consequences. That's the structure of emotional blackmail. That's pretty easy to see. Yeah. 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 Do you, um, and it's interesting because in your, as you discuss it in the book, this question of like the punishment, Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you read it, you can see like, all right, these people who are employing emotional blackmail, Mm they, that's the only way that they see, I suppose, to get leverage. Right. Right. That's a very good point. They don't have the repertoire of other responses to being turned down on something. They don't know how to accept something in a uh, gracious or loving way. They don't know how. All they know is, oh, you're not going to give me what I want? Well, the hell with you, and you're going to feel the the brunt of my wrath now. Then they yell. Uh, they do everything they can that has worked for them in the pet. They give the, or on the other side of the coin, they get the silent treatment. They sulk. 
they uh, close the slam doors, get in their car, and are, the wheels will be screeching because they're so upset and angry, and you're left feeling horrible because the person that you care about, you've upset them. And so the next thing you find yourself doing is, okay, how do I make this okay? How do I make this this panic inside of me go away? I mean, when we're being punished, we get scared. And we get that awful anxiety. And we will do almost anything, including compromising our self-respect and our well-being to make that panic go away. And because they say people that are targets of emotional blackmail, when I work with them and teach them how to um, counteract it, they say, oh, I, I, I couldn't stand it if he got mad at me, or I couldn't stand it if he walked out. Yeah, you can. You can stand it. Quit lying to yourself. You're a grown-up person with options and choices. You can stand it. And if the person you're dealing with is so unreasonable that they won't dialogue with you, communicate with you about, you know, don't do it in the heat of the uh, disagreement. But after things have calmed down a little bit, then you say, look, I need to talk to you about what happened yesterday because I'm feeling very upset and, and I don't want our relationship to, to go down this road uh, anymore. And so it's real important to gather up your courage because nothing will change if you, you can't wait for the other person to change. The only way the other person is going to change is if you change. That doesn't mean you're doing bad things. If you're the target of emotional blackmail, it just means that you're letting your fears run your life and make your choices for you. That's what has to change. And you'd be amazed, Neil, you and your audience, you'd be amazed at what happens when you set your limits and boundaries and it's not okay for you to treat me this way and it's not acceptable for you to continually scare me and make me feel guilty because I didn't do something you wanted me to do. How can we work together to find a way to make this relate? That's negotiating for a healthier relationship. And we all have choices when a relationship goes off the track. We can accept things the way they are. Not my favorite choice. We can negotiate for a healthier relationship. And if the person that you're dealing with is rational, then that very well can be the best route. Or, worst comes to worst, you can end the relationship. There is no relationship that is worth your mental and emotional well-being. Yeah. And this stuff can wear you out. This stuff can grind you down so that you lose, not lose, I always tell people you don't lose, you misplace. Uh, your, your dignity, your confidence, your self-respect, your self-respect, and a sense of your own courage. And if that's ground down and you get the sense that those things are in a greyhound locker somewhere, uh, then you're in trouble. And it may very well be that the person you're dealing with is not amenable to any kind of negotiation. And that's something you only know if you do the limit setting and the boundary setting and confront them honestly about what their behavior is doing to you. Mm, so when you say that, like, what would that, what would that sound like to, to let an emotional blackmailer know the cost of how they're treating you? You are pushing our relationship to the edge of a cliff. And I don't know that you're taking me seriously when I tell you that I'm not happy, that let's say it's a marriage, because that's probably the, the most common situation uh, for most people listening. Or the, the other, I mean, this is really your day-to-day -day life. Um, and that we need to find ways to uh, solve problems and conflicts that don't involve me ending up feeling beaten, emotionally battered, uh, like I always give up, I always comply, and I'm just not willing to live that way anymore. It's not okay for me. I need to be treated with respect, with caring, 
If I do something you don't like, just let me know. Don't punish me. Don't threaten me. I'm not going to tolerate those behaviors anymore. That's kind of, you know, off the top of my head. Sounded Um, great. (laughs) Oh, well, thank you. So let's go into the the strategies for how to uh, change the course with when you are on the receiving end of emotional mm-hmm. blackmail. And I, I think suffice to say the conversation around if you're a blackmailer, it starts to come, I think what I was hearing from you is that um, you could learn some skills on how to negotiate and how to hear a no and how to stay positive and generative. And like, if you, so if you see those patterns happening in yourself, then those might be some valuable skills that you're not quite developed in. Does that seem reasonable? (laughs) Okay. Well, you know, owning your own behavior and taking responsibility for it and uh, finding ways to kind of move the internal furniture around is uh, a sure sign of maturity and well-being and health. Uh, An unwillingness to own and always putting the blame on the other person is a sure sign of a lack of maturity and a lack of uh, emotional well-being and health. So uh, it has to start with uh, the... Target. We're primarily talking about skills and, and techniques for the target of the blackmailer, right? Yes. Sort of reversing the behavior of compliance. Correct. Yeah, I was yeah. just, I was giving those people who are listening, who are saying, oh my goodness, like, I'm doing that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm an emotional blackmailer. Like, I didn't want to leave them hanging. I wanted them to well, have a sense of like, okay, this is what I need to learn. You know, They're taking the first step. They're taking responsibility. Now, they may not have the skills or the knowledge to change their behavior, but at least identifying it, labeling it, and owning it is certainly the first step. And then if you have uh, the courage to sit down with the person that you're blackmailing and say, look, I realize that I have been a bully, an emotional bully, that I have pushed you around, And I really want, and you know, what I believe, I, Susan, believe as uh, somebody who's been in this world a long time and done this work for, oh God, almost 40 years, um, that um, that goes a long way to just acknowledge and admit and fess up and own it to creating a climate of much greater safety because people that are your target if you're the blackmailer do never do not do never great great expression do do not feel safe and to me safety is the primary element that will define or not define a good relationship and if the person is that you're blackmailing is kind of heavily defended because they're scared a lot of the time, uh, the way to get through to them and the way to let them know that um, that you really mean it because I'm sorry by itself, or, that's just words. And unless I'm sorry is followed by behavioral change, it doesn't mean doodly. And so the thing that you can do is, if you are the blackmailer, because I don't leave anybody hanging, is to say, can you help me? Tell me how I can express this to you in a way that won't make you feel bad. Mm -hmm. What a loving thing to say. Help me out here. Or if I can't do this on my own, I'm willing to go into counseling. Another very loving thing to say. So, you know, try it on your own first. See if you can find ways and help have the other person say, well, it would really feel so much better if you put it to me this way. If if I want to take a class at night and you don't want me to go out, if you were to say something like, you know, I'd really prefer that you didn't didn't go out at night. Uh, And then if I say this class means a lot to me, then you can get out of your own needs and, and have some compassion for mine and say, look, okay, uh, I'll be waiting for you and I'll be happy to see you when you get back. That would be a healthy dialogue. 
Thank you. Yeah, that's yeah. that's really that's really helpful. Good. Um, let's go back now to the now that we've Target. made sure no one is is hanging. Let's. Uh, yeah, I, I really want to hear from you about when someone is a target of blackmail. How do they mm-hmm. how do they get the ship back on course? Okay, uh, I want to read quickly a checklist to your audience. Uh, when how to find out if you are a target and. Um, I'm going to read this right from the book. There's just about 10 of them. I tell myself that giving in is no big deal. I tell myself that giving in is worth it if it gets the other person to shut up. I tell myself that what I want is wrong. I tell myself that it's not worth the hassle. I give in now because I'll take a stand later. I tell myself it's better to give in than to hurt their feelings. I don't stand up for myself. I give away my power. I do things to please other people and get confused about what I want. I acquiesce. I give up people and activities that I care about to please the backmailer. Um, and those things sound pretty wimpy, but um, they're not because I mean, they are wimpy in the sense that you haven't got any substitute. Those are automatic behaviors for you that you may have learned as a child. They may be a pattern and a part of your classic behavior in the world. Um, This whole thing about putting yourself second, feeling disempowered, feeling like a second-class citizen is what has to change. You have as much, much rights as the other person. And if you hurt somebody's feelings or they get upset with you, you just have to tolerate the discomfort. And um, the first thing that I think you have to do is go through that checklist and see how many of them apply to you. And a lot of those things will apply and some of them won't. But if most of them do, then you have to make some changes. The first skill that I give people is to stop. Take a breath. Don't do the automatic, oh yeah, okay, all right, fine. Um, Do nothing. And say things like, um, uh, I'm not willing to make a decision right now. Um, I need to think about this like a grown-up. I'll I'll get back to you. Uh, I have to sort of look at how I'm really feeling about this, and let's talk about it in a little while. See, all those things will allow you to kind of garner your strength, uh, put your cognitive skills to work, because what happens with emotional blackmail is like we're pure emotion. Um, we're pure feeling, spilling over like pancake batter. And a healthy decision is made by a combination of your intellect and your emotions. And if you can feel and think at the same time, then you've got a way to go. So that is the first step, is to stop. Put it on your timetable. If they demand an answer right away, say, you know, are we going to go on that vacation or not? I'm not ready to decide. Back off. Give me some time. Give me some space here. Um, It's going to put them off balance. It's a new uh, set of behaviors for you, and new behavior is always scary to the other person, and they'll do a full court press to get you back into your old ways because that was the way they were comfortable. That was familiar territory. So you may do it right and then feel bad, which is very common because that's what guilt is. Guilt is doing it right and feeling bad. If you're doing the healthy thing, the healthy feelings will catch up. A lot of people think they have to feel stronger before they can show strength. It's not true. Do it, and then the feelings will catch up. Uh, I worked early in my career in lots of psychiatric hospitals, and people would always say, and we did, I was running the um, role-playing groups, and I would ask people to do a simulated job interview. And they'd say, oh, I'm too scared to do that right now. I'll do it when I feel better. And I say, no, do it 
and you'll feel better. And it never failed to be true. And that's the same thing in human relationships. You can't wait until you feel better when you have this kind of, of an unhealthy interaction with somebody. So, yeah, it takes courage. And after you have stopped and given yourself some time, then you have to deal with your discomfort. I do a lot of different techniques than just talk therapy because I think talk therapy is very limited. And unfortunately, it's what a lot of therapists will do and only do. Uh, I do a lot of role playing. I do a lot of visualizations. I do a lot of um, talking to the elements in yourself, kind of gestalt thing, uh, making them entities. Uh, have a talk with your discomfort. Have, have, write a letter to your guilt. You know, guilt, get the hell out of my life. You've been plaguing me and torturing me and keeping me from being the best self that I can be. You'd be amazed how effective these techniques are. Uh, because they cut right to the heart of things. That's why I don't believe in long-term therapy. Uh, cause I get to the heart of things quickly and my people get better. And they get better because they do these things that allow them to confront the demons inside of them. And the guilt demon is a huge one for all of us. And I ask them to cut pictures out of magazines of horrible creatures that are their guilt demons and put, paste it on a cardboard and put it on a chair and talk to it as if it were a bad child. And just say, you've got to stop. You've got to get out of my head. You've got to get out of my life. You've got to stop making decisions for me. And when you get that kind of power going, it is amazing what can happen to you. I also so, liked your um, um, your questions for sort of dismantling guilt. Um, yeah. And I, I have them in front of me, so I'll just read them. Um, uh, is what you did or want to do malicious? Is what you did or want to do cruel? Good. Is what you did or want to do abusive? Is what you did or want to do insulting, belittling, or demeaning? Is what you did or want to do truly harmful to the other person's well-being? And if you're answering no to all those questions, then... There's nothing to be guilty about. Right, right. But there are two kinds of guilt. There's deserved guilt when we do something really bad uh, to somebody uh, or that's not okay by our own values and ethics. Uh, and then there's undeserved guilt, and that's what 99% of the people that therapists are going to see work with is undeserved guilt. They, it was my fault when your parents abused you. It was my fault because... They were, they didn't love me. I must be unlovable. And from that core belief of it's my fault, you can see how that carries over into relationships, uh, whether it's friendships or work relationships or love relationships. If you are believing the lie that it's your fault, everything's your fault, you're going to be a prime target for emotional blackmail. And guilt is the major, I believe, element of the fog. Fear, of course, is very powerful as well. Uh, but it's that damn guilt that really just kind of seeps through our body and our hearts and our minds. And that's the undeserved guilt. That's the guilt where we twist ourselves into a pretzel to please and accommodate the other person. And it's time to stop. In our chat before the interview got started, you mentioned mm -hmm. that it's important to protect yourself rather than defend yourself. And that sounded really important to me. So I'm mm -hmm. hoping you can elaborate on that a little bit. It's a natural tendency when we're attacked. Um, and I don't mean physically. None of this is, is going into that arena. When you're attacked emotionally, uh, to defend yourself, to get defensive. No, I didn't. Well, don't you remember when you did this? Uh, you're always picking on me. Uh, you need to stop this. Um, it, you always lose. You always get your back against the wall, trying to give good reasons, rationalizing your behavior is always going to leave you feeling one down. So it is essential 
to learn in order to protect yourself non-defensive communication skills. And I know that I have lots of them in the book. Uh, things like, I'm sure you see it that way. You're entitled to your opinion. Let's talk about this when you're calmer. I'm not willing to have this conversation. This subject is off limits. Uh, I'm not willing to take the responsibility for something I didn't do. Those are non-defensive communication skills, and they immediately de-escalate the conflict because the other person's off balance. They're so used to you saying, well, I only did that because, or, you know, you do that too. Um, they are flabbergasted. Think what it would be like if your mother's criticizing you and you said, mm, I'm sure you see it that way. She wouldn't have any place to go. <laughs> or, I'm so sorry you're upset. Well, of course I'm upset. What do you plan to do about it? Oh, I'm not going to do anything about it, but I'm sorry you're upset. Whole different way. And with blackmail, it really makes a difference because blackmail thrives on conflict. It thrives on escalation. It thrives on you getting lower and lower and lower in the power structure. And that's what happens when you feel bullied and somebody is telling you how awful you are and all the bad things you did. So instead of jumping to your defense, jump to non-defensive behavior so that they can't continue because as soon as you say, well, I only did that because, you're opening the door to them having a whole myriad of things to come back at you with. But if you say, and, and the one that really stops things, you could be right. <laughs> what are you going to say to that one? <laughs> so, yeah, one of the things that I'm proudest of in the many years I've been working is that I have taught so many people non-defensive communication skills, and that's one of the greatest tools that you will have against emotional blackmail. Yeah, and that section of your book is very rich, so I, I definitely yeah. recommend that, um, along with everything else in the book. Um, I have one more question for you, and I, I just want to say how much I appreciate your taking the time to be with us today. You're and very welcome. I love doing this. You know that. <laughs> Great. I used to make my living many, many, many years ago as an actress. So there's you know, somewhat of the performer in me. I just love to do media. Well, I can tell that you're you're shining and smiling right now for sure <laughs> um, but before I ask you my last question um, yeah. I'm I wanted to just give you an opportunity to let people know uh, how they can find out about you more and and um, and I know that you're doing a lot of phone consultations right. with people now so could you right. talk about that for a minute sure uh, I started the phone therapy when my books became successful because I had so many people that wanted to work with me that were out of the area. In fact, in Europe, in Asia, uh, I have a client in Beijing, China. Phone therapy is tremendously effective. I do basically the same work we would do face-to-face. -face. Um, it's a way of really focusing intensely on the emotional information in the voice. And most of the people that I'm working with now, I've never met. I do ask them to send me pictures, but the communication and the connection and the bonding that occurs is just as great as it would be if we were face-to-face. -face. I'm a great fan of phone counseling. I really am. And people can find me, A, on my website, which is susanforward.com, and there are all kinds of, uh, my, my email number is in there, uh, my address rather, you can see I'm still technically in the dark ages, <laughs> uh, it's just susanforward6 at aol.com, and that will take you to where you can directly get in touch with me. And by the way, I answer every email personally. I don't have a staff because I think it's important that I make that connection with people right off the bat. So that's, and thank you for, for allowing me to do that because, uh, I believe that good short-term therapy is essential 
to a good life when you're having conflicts and issues that you can't resolve on your, by yourself because we can't look at our own unconscious. Absolutely. We need, we need a guide. And I've been privileged to be that guide for thousands of people, I guess, over the years because I used to run like 15 groups a week. So that adds up in terms of the numbers of people that I've worked with. It certainly does. And we will have all of those links in the show notes and um, as well as your email address. And just to remind everyone, if you go to neilsatin.com slash blackmail, um, B A L. B-L-A-C-K-M-A-I-L or text the word passion to the number 33444 then that will uh, get you links so you can download the show guide and get links to Susan's site and her email and all of that. So um, thank you so much again, Susan. One last question for you. We spent a lot of time talking about guilt and I'm wondering because fear seems like such a big motivator. It's like what clamps people down and you have a great um, chapter in the book cutting through the fog that's that deals specifically with fear and obligation and guilt and I'm wondering if we can just maybe if you can take us out by talking a little bit about how to get get ahead of your fear and so that it's not so crippling when it comes to taking the courageous action that you need to take when you're um, changing course with a blackmailer mm -hmm. well a lot of our Fears are old feelings that we believe are st that those events are still current. And so we're living in the present as if it were the past. There is a wonderful uh, parable about an elephant that they tie down with a rope to a stake. And, of course, the elephant knows he can't move. So then they take the rope off, and the elephant still doesn't move because he believes that he's still he's still tied down. And I think that's a marvelous uh, metaphor for human beings. The ropes are gone. The bad stuff that you grew up with is gone. It may be still alive inside of you, but you're now an adult and you have options and choices and you don't any longer have to be controlled by old fears. And that's what gets activated when somebody scares us. It's daddy yelling at us. It's mother criticizing us or uh, hitting us. And we will do anything to avoid a replay of those experiences when we were hopeless, helpless, and dependent. And we're not hopeless, helpless, and dependent anymore. So remember, the ropes are gone. And I think fear of the of other people's anger is maybe the biggest fear. And it takes a very special kind of courage, which we all have, but don't acknowledge and ask ourselves, what's the worst thing that can happen? You know, there's a, a fine book out there by Susan Jeffers called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. And I say, yeah, great message. Feel the fear and do it anyway. What is your fantasy of what's going to happen? What are you afraid of in reality? And if you do that kind of exploration, you'll find that the ropes, if not completely gone, will definitely loosen. Great. Thank you so much, Susan Forward, for um, such a valuable insight and your contribution to uh, the wellness in people's lives. Yeah. And, you. uh, and I, I like your mantra that you can stand it. It's yeah. not. And uh, so uh, thank you so much for helping everyone figure that out, that it's actually not as bad as they think it is. Well, uh, thank you, Neil, for a wonderful interview and giving me a chance to express these things that I believe so deeply. Absolutely. Uh, my pleasure. Okay, take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye now. Thank you for listening to another episode of Relationship Alive. If you like what you've heard and want to make it easier for other people to find out about us, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and to rate and review us on iTunes. If you have questions or comments or want to continue the conversation, you can always join our Relationship Alive community Facebook group. 
And for more information about today's episode, visit us online at neilsatin.com slash podcast. Or you can always text the word passion, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444 for more information. Finally, do you have a burning question that you're hoping we can have answered here on Relationship Alive, either for a future or past guest? Let me know and I'll see what I can do. Take care and see you next time.